My name is Dr. Pulsani. I'm Director of Cardiovascular CT at Piedmont Heart Institute. I'll be giving you a talk on CTA planning for transcatheter therapies for aortic mitral and tricuspid valves and uh, go over protocols and few ex case examples in this presentation. I have no disclosures for this presentation. Goals of this presentation are basically uh, go over basically transcatheter therapy protocols for ta TAVI, TMVR, and TTVR, and a few examples of artifacts that can happen with the uh, uh, heart rhythm, and few case examples of TAVR and TMVR and TTVR. Transcatheter uh, therapy interventions basically have been, are growing rapidly, and with it, the need of planning for these procedures accurately has become very important. Transcatheter therapy for aortic valve is standard of care in low, intermediate, and high-risk patients currently. Transcatheter mitral and tricuspid therapies are currently being evaluated and developed as we speak about the uh, for tri transcatheter interventions in those arenas. CTA, by definition, plays a fundamental role uh, in complete pre-procedural planning of these procedures. Reason being, CTA has highest spatial resolution with isotropic imaging to assess the aortic root, mitral complex, or tricuspid valve. Gating for cardiac rhythm and improvements in temporal resolution have tremendously helped in this field. Every transcatheter therapy study has CTA, CTA as a fundamental component for planning. Current challenges with CTA imaging are basically the length of interpretation for this transcatheter therapy is longer and planning takes time. Uh, obviously, the, the goals of this presentation, as I said, are to present protocols, um, scanning techniques, and dealing with the rhythm artifacts, in some case examples for transcatheter planning for TAVI, TMBR, and TTBR. From the protocol standpoint, uh, the most important thing to remember is to have good access and having a contrast warmer. The reason being contrast warmer is necessary because you inject contrast at higher rates for most of the cardiovascular imaging and it keeps the viscosity down so that you can inject at higher rates. Uh, good IV access is very much necessary for this procedure. 18 gauge is always necessary because of high contrast rates. And there are uh, IVs with not just end hole, but end hole and side hole uh, IVs that decrease the IV infiltration, which can be used. That would be the step one as protocol for acquisition in these patients. Protocol step two uh, for structural planning of cardiac imaging is retrospective, uh, mostly uh, with or without dose modulation, because we need both systolic and diastolic phases for planning. Uh, I will go over a few, uh, and you need to understand how to tackle uh, different complexities with ar arrhythmia, with atrial fibrillation. PVCs, and how to reconstruct when you reconstruct when you have irregular rhythm, uh, like phase reconstruction versus absolute reconstruction in this, uh, with these techniques. New generation scanners, uh, the need for beta blockers has come down and acquisition is more streamlined. And as I said, majority of the structural planning is retrospective gating with uh, uh, dose modulation if needed. Step three of the protocol, and understanding the coverage anatomy for structural planning. You know, structural planning, obviously, you want to know the reason we are uh, scanning the heart, obviously, that's where we are intervening. And the reason we are scanning distally peripherals is due to access. So this scout image kind of gives you an uh, example of how we scan our patients uh, usually. We scan cardiocranial, cardiocranial, for the heart and we go up catch at the subclavians or higher and come down to the femorals for access. This decreases the, follows the contrast well, decreases the duration of scan to uh, overall. So the acquisition will include basically heart, then a chest, abdomen, and pelvis. A uh, reason obviously, as I said, you do chest, abdomen, and pelvis is to decide on access. For TAVRs, you need an arterial phase for TMVR and TTVR, they're transvenous axis, so you need a venous phase imaging. 
the step three uh, is very important to have a good coverage for the scanning. Step four, this is one thing that's unique that not all institutions follow. Most institutions like following bolus tracking, but as a cardio cardiologist who does cardiovascular imaging, I like using test bolus technique for uh, scanning car cardiac patients. In this technique, the, the most important thing to remember is the advantages of test, test bolus technique. This tests the IV for pressure limit, and you can administer at higher contrast rates. And it also gives good contrast to pacification because you know what is the peak at which you're going to scan the patient. And there is patient specific delay time that could be assessed using a uh, test bolus technique, uh, using the patient's hemodynamics basically. How do we use the delay time? Basically uh, you do a cross-sectional image at one, one spot right at the PA bifurcation and you acquire uh, you inject 15 cc contrast followed by some saline, uh, 30 cc saline or 50 cc saline, and you get the peak Hounsfield units in the ascending aorta. And our threshold for uh, injecting contrast is we want at least 150 Hounsfield units in this ascending aorta, and we basically inject contrast at that rate. Uh, and we use the, the delay time you get, time to peak, and for TAVRs, we add a little time, about three seconds. For TMBRs, we add about three seconds. For TTBRs, since it's a RV, right ventricle needs to be opacified, we actually take some time off this peak and uh, get, the, uh, get the time, uh, get the peak delay time that we add for the scanning. It's very important to know that we are dealing in valve patients, the delay times can be longer. If you were to purely use bolus tracking, you may not get enough contrast for the right spot for you to image the patient. Sometimes in leaky valves, the delay time could be very long, up to 40 seconds. Or if the heart function is low, heart is very enlarged, you need a lot of contrast in one spot for you to scan. So it becomes very important. Protocol step five, our injection protocol. We use the test bullets technique, as I said, and in large uh, BMI patients, we use up to 30 cc of contrast instead of 15 cc of contrast for test bolus. We do on our prote injection protocol, we do triple phase injection. We like, uh, we like left side chambers to have more contrast followed by some contrast in the right side chambers. We, we do this because we want to do functional study. We assess the LV function, RV function. We also ass assess the valve motion. So we basically inject a pure contrast, 50% uh, of it. And the second phase, we mix it with saline and contrast and inject. And the, the last portion is saline chase, basically. And we use it for, depending on patient's body uh, BMI, we may inject more contrast. Here is our protocol step four scan setup we tend to use. We want peak Hounsfield units, as I said, 150. If we don't, we forget very less than 150 because of high BMI, we tend to increase the rate of contrast. If we get um, high, very high Hounsfield units, we decrease the rate by one. If it's more than 250 Hounsfield units, just on the test bolus technique. And on the left here are different procedures we perform and different times uh, we add to the delay time for scanning using the test bolus technique for different uh, cardiovascular scans we perform. Overall, when you're done with a scan, like uh, uh, for a structural scan, we end up having a topogram. We do basically a flash panning scan because we want to scan heart as narrowly as possible, followed by obviously a test bolus. And the la then we do our cardiac retrospective scan followed by chest, abdomen, and pelvis scan. Uh, these are different uh, things that we acquire so that we analyze this data. CT image acquisition, the current uh, standard is to obviously, for TAVRs, you need to have ECG synchronization. You're assessing the aortic route. You want to minimize the motion artifacts from patients breathing, heart arrhythmia, and you want to reconstruct at isotropic walk sulfur uh, with acquisition. And uh, uh, you want to image the peripheral art, art, arteries with good contrast because access is decided by those uh, uh, peripheral art, arterial dimensions. 
contrast reduction and adherence to protocol for prevention of contra contrast induced nephro nephropathies recommended. M majority of the scanning right now is dependent on GFR. If the GFR is greater than 30, we pretty much scan all patients with contrast. We do use less contrast, uh, decrease the contrast dose in patients who, whose GFR is between 30 and 45. Now, stepping uh, further, uh, discussing some of the artifacts that you have to deal with when you're doing cardiovascular imaging is uh, in, in the Z-axis coverage may not be complete because it's not a volume acquisition. So you may have misalignment or if you're doing a scanning where the heart rate, uh, the pitch is set for a certain number, but the uh, heart rate drops during the scan the scanners are so fast, the generation of scanners we deal with, you may have interpolation artifact as represented here. This is the interpolation artifact because the scan, as you see, the heart rate when it was set to acquire was for high, but when the patient held the breath, the heart rate dropped and the pitch was set for low. And what ended up happening was the, there is interpolation artifact. This is a kind of artifact you deal with sometimes when you're dealing with heart rhythms. So the, the main thing to use, uh, avoid here is doing the breath testing on the patients to see if the heart rate drops during acquisition. The other challenge obviously uh, in sequential imaging is uh, misalignment because of change, change in heart rate uh, during acquisition. And as you can see here, the heart rate of 54, 59, and 66, and there is a misalignment in the coronary because this lab uh, reconstruction is at a different phase versus the rest of the coronary. And this is also represented here as a misalignment line going across. The way to deal with this is to understand this is misalignment and to avoid uh, issues with interpretation. As a physician, I do we do true stack reconstruction. And you can see on the left side, this is a true stack reconstruction that shows the misalignment line. And I immediately know this is not uh, an artifact and not any stenosis or anything that I have to deal with. Going into uh, main things basically of TAVR reconstruction for interpretation, uh, very important to know, as I said, the reason how we assess uh, TAVR assessment for reconstruction is obviously you want to know the dimensions of the annulus as I, as I show here, because the dimensions of the annulus of the iota, which is right here, iota mitral, uh, iotic complex, decides the size of the valve that is placed in here. And also you can assess the valve anatomy, calcification of the valve. You can assess the dimensions of sinotubular junction and assess the heights of coronary arteries. As, as you see here, this is the right coronary artery. This is the left coronary artery. And these are the peripheral arteries which show the axis sites. The reason to do all this is TAVI procedure is completely planned by this. The annular measurements define the size of the valve that's used and peripheral axis is decided by the dimensions of the femoral arteries because of the sheets that are used for TAVI procedure. Coronary heights are important because the valve can, if the heights are very low, coronary arteries can get occluded. You can see the importance of CT in this. CT can pretty much plan all of this procedure. It not only can plan all of the procedure, if patients are being planned for this, there is a thought right now, CT could be one-stop shop for management of these patients. Where you can see these three images here in this patient, although there is significant coronary calcification, we could assess these coronary arteries for stenosis using nitro. And we assess the coronary arteries at the same time. This prevents improves planning because the patient will not need what we call a heart catheterization before this procedure is done. So uh, TAVR interpretation, the acquisition of the heart followed by peripherals helps us reconstruct all these images. If any lab is performing TAVI scans, these would be the images that would be required and reconstructed for the procedure planning. 
if the institution is uh, uh, doing TAVI procedures. For the, this will help the interventional cardiologist to do structural intervention and planning of the procedure. And these are sample images of different valves that could be used in TAVI procedures. And you know, there is few valves that are out there that are being used, uh, which are commercially used right now. One here is Sapien, one is Evolute. There are a few that are already in trials that are being uh, still looked at. And these are sample examples of TAVI valves that are used. There is increased trend and interest in assessing coronary anatomy at the same time as assessing the TAVI procedure. You could imagine why this is because that will this will decrease the number of procedures the patient gets before they can get the tablet procedure. Uh, that in, to get assist coronary arteries, what we do is uh, we have to give nitroglycerin. So there is a risk of giving nitroglycerin patients with aortic stenosis. But in carefully selected patients, you could give nitroglycerin without any complications. And these are the patients we would exclude who should not get nitroglycerin prior to getting a CTA for TAVR. One, patients with syncope, patients with acute coronary syndrome, patients with prior bypass surgery, critical aortic stenosis, low heart failure patients, and patients during the scan, you may find they have arrhythmias and you would imagine that it would be tough to assess their coronary anatomy. And we exclude those patients also from procedure assessment. For those of you who are interested in further learning about TAVR planning and TAVR interpretation and also TAVR scanning, uh, I would say, please read this consensus document from SECT, uh, well-written. It has good uh, points that, that everybody should learn if you're planning TAVR procedures. And TAVR consensus document has summary of recommendations for CT acquisition. How do you acquire uh, the study? What cutoffs of GFR and who should be getting it, who should not be getting it? And also when, when not to administer nitroglycerin. TAVR consensus document also addresses the, for reporting of vascular access and coronary anatomy and also uh, annulus measurements for procedure assessment. I would highly recommend reading this document for uh, understanding of procedure planning. Now, stepping gears here, uh, think of doing TMVR, valve and valve procedure planning. This is, we talked about transcatheter aortic valve intervention, which is well um, recognized procedure now. It's being done very commonly It's uh, across the country. There's a lot of data for it and high risk, low risk, intermediate risk patients. T transcatheter mitral valve therapy, unlike TAVI, is being still studied. But CT still is the planning technique for this. The reason being high spatial resolution again of ability to assess the mitral valve complex. What's interesting is uh, all of the mitral valve complex, mitral leaflets, annulus of the mitral valve, and also the sub-mitral sub caudal structures of the uh, papillary muscle are well assessed by CT because of high spatial resolution. The way TMVR works is either the valve is placed transapically or transvenous axis and they go transeptal and place the valve in the mitral position here. The procedure itself, the reasons to do CT for planning are once you place the valve, as you can see, it can obstruct the flow across the aortic valve causing what we call obstruction of flow across the left ventricular outflow tract here. So all the planning for TMBR is dependent on placing a, what we call an STL file valve in the mitral position and understanding when you place a valve like that, what happens with the flow across the LVOT 
uh, not the flow, but how much LVOT anatomy uh, area is left, what happens to the anterior mitral leaflet, and whether this is going to obstruct the flow would be uh, checked during this uh, during procedure planning. And as you can see on these images on the right side, we have, measured, we have placed a valve and we are measuring the area, which is called Neo-LVOT, and a certain area we use for different valves below which we, we think there's a high risk of obstruction to flow across the left ventricular outflow tract. There are various kinds of transcatheter mitral valve procedures that are being performed right now. Uh, I'll go over three examples here. One is what we call valve and ring, which is basically patients who have had mitral valve surgery in the past they may get a ring that's placed in the mitral position, but the native leaflets of the valve have degenerated now, causing either stenosis or regurgitation across the mitral valve. And the, this could be addressed by using a, placing a valve in the ring. Uh, and that valve planning can be done by placing a STL file of the valve and measuring the area uh, Neo-LBOT, as we call, how much of that area is left, whether it will obstruct the flow or not, would be the way to look at it. This is called valve and ring. Valve and MAC is another thing where there is a lot, what MAC stands for is mitral annular calcification. This calcification all along the annulus that's obstructing the flow across the mitral valve. And if this causes mitral stenosis, could do what we call valve placement in the mitral annular calcification and decree improve the flow across the mitral valve. Even this planning is when it's done, CT is the technique used for planning this procedure. As you can see, uh, the role and contribution of imaging modalities in the, uh, in the co context of transcatheter mitral valve placement, CT definitely anything that you take anatomic CT has the highest spatial resolution. It will have three pluses. Anything that has re to related to flow measurements, obviously echocardiography is the technique to use measure flows and that will have a better, uh, it's a better modality to measure flow. I would recommend reading this paper for anybody who is interested in interpretation of transcatheter mitral valves by Philip Blanc. And it has a lot of information on planning for transcatheter mitral valve placements. These are examples of some of the valves that are out there that have been, uh, are being studied for transcatheter mitral valve placement. And th there are different kinds of valves that are being studied by different uh, uh, companies for uh, approval. And there are a few which are in feasibility uh, trials, some which are in phase three trials uh, currently. Jumping uh, to transcatheter tricuspid valve therapies. If TAVI is a very mature field, TMVR is kind of developing, transcatheter tricuspid valve therapies have just started developing. And tri tricuspid valve is on the right side and it basically has, can have significant regurgitation. And how do you treat uh, tri tri tricuspid valve uh, procedure planning is on the right RV. This is the right ventricle, right atrium. Planning is majority done with CT because again, spatial resolution. But remember as, a, as we acquire this image, you need to have enough contrast on this side. So as you remember, you want to tr trigger the scan using delay time, but you take time off your delay time up to six seconds so that you have enough contrast on the right side for assessment of uh, the annulus of the tricuspid valve. Most of the planning is based on the annulus of the tricuspid valve currently. And there are a few valves that are being studied in this arena for uh, intervention currently. And majority of the planning for any of the uh, trials that are going on are using CT is the primary technique that's being used for planning these patients. The, this is example of what we used to know about Tricuspid valve, we always thought there's three leaflets, but there's more and more data that's coming out that shows that tricuspid valve has, could have different anatomy. It could have multiple uh, commissures, 
It could be very redundant tissue and it could have a different anatomy base that could be, that needs to be uh, assessed uh, better either using transesophageal echo and CT definitely helps if it's acquired well with good contrast timing. Just to give a perspective on uh, CTA for valves, I know we are dealing in tough times with COVID. Uh, there are a few things we have done CTA as the primary modality in certain cases because uh, transesophageal echo, as you can understand, could be a high risk for uh, transmission of COVID. And the, some of the procedures have been curbed because of COVID surge last year. There are a few examples I want to share where we have seen uh, we have used CT as a great technique to assess the patients. For example, this is a patient that actually was uh, had bacteremia, febrile, came in with significant aortic valve insufficiency. This is the aortic valve. And the patient was referred for surgery when you could not do TE um, because of PPE shortage at that point. We ended up doing CT and you can see the endocarditis on the valve here that dark linear structure here. And at the same time, we could assess the coronary arteries of the patient. This actually decreased the time because uh, going to the procedure because this patient in conventional way would have gotten a transesophageal echo to assess this, followed by a heart catheterization to assess this. But in this situation, you could have done, we did one test that gave the coronary anatomy, we got the valve anatomy, and this patient went for surgery. So that, and patient had an echocardiogram demonstrating significant leakiness of that valve and he ended up getting surgery. This is another example where I want to share a mechanical valve assessment. You can see clearly there is a thrombus here that's creating um, opening, uh, opening of, decreasing the opening of this disc. And here is an example where there is a flail posterior leaflet and that's causing a significant MR on the echo, on the CT, the spatial resolution has, uh, is great to assess this. Here is an example of bioprosthetic valve that had endocarditis and you can see the uh, lesion on the valve. These are all acquired where we avoided doing transesophageal echo to assess the problem. And we saw basically uh, the anatomy so well on CT. And this is another example. Traditionally, this is called a surgeon's view and you would be thinking of seeing this on a transesophageal echo where you can see a flail leaflet. This is the anterior mitral leaflet of the mitral valve. This is the posterior. And you can see the anatomy so well, and there is flail posterior P2 scallop of the mitral valve. And that is so well visualized on the CT. Now CT application will keep increasing for valvular heart disease in general majority of the planning for structural heart disease will be done by CT. And I, in the end, want to put a plug in for multimodality imaging in general. It's very important to understand that some pathologies may not be assessed by one modality. You may have to do more than one modality to assess a pathology sometimes. This is an example of a patient who basically had high gradient across the LVOT by echo, Doppler. Doppler is the best technique to assess the peak velocities across any orifice, that, uh, any flow acceleration. Anatomy here, the, I see the flow acceleration in the cardiac MRI SSFP image, and I see the flow acceleration is here. But see the spatial resolution of CT showing this uh, abnormal attachment of cardi. That's the reason this flow acceleration is happening. And this patient had such high gradients and abnormal attachment of cordae was leading to this gradient across the LVOT. This was surgically corrected in this patient. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for uh, listening to this presentation. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh,